Greetings, my friends, and welcome to this six-session course in Principles of Biblical Interpretation, otherwise known as hermeneutics. Let me give you a brief overview of our course before we jump into our material. The course is going to have six sessions. The first three sessions are going to focus on the foundations of biblical interpretation. And the last three sessions will be essentially a workshop in biblical interpretation where we will look at a number of different passages in different types of literature in the Bible and do some interpretation together. Our first session is titled The Nature of the Bible and the Goals of Interpretation. So in this first session we're going to lay a foundation for approaching the Bible. Now as we do this we're going to ask and answer four questions. The first question is this, what is the Bible? What is its nature? Secondly, what is in the Bible? Here we're going to be focusing on the question of the content of the Bible. Third, why do we need to interpret the Bible? Why is this process important? Why do we need to do it? And we're going to finish with a fourth question, how have others interpreted the Bible? And here we're going to be looking at the history of Bible interpretation and to a certain extent the history of interpretation of other kinds of literature because those forms of interpretation have affected how people have approached and interpreted the Bible. Well, Let's start with our first question. What is the Bible? First and foremost, the Bible is a revelation from God. It's a means of communication in which God reveals to mankind what he wants us to know. This is God giving us a message, giving us information that's vital for us. Now the Bible is an inspired revelation from God. If you have studied the doctrine of inspiration, you know that the Bible teaches that scripture is God's outbreathed word. Now although God used humans to pen and to preserve the Bible, it's fundamentally God's own word. Here we're talking about something called dual authorship. God used humans, he guided them, he worked through their individual personalities and their circumstances, but he did so in such a way that what ended up on the paper, what is in our Bibles, is fundamentally God's own word. The Bible is also an inerrant revelation from God. Now, inerrant means without error. Because the Bible is God's word, and God does not err. The Bible is true in all that it asserts. Now let's focus for a moment on that final statement. The Bible is true in all that it asserts. The Bible records a number of statements that are not true. For example, you can find a place in the Bible that says, there is no God. Of course, that's a quotation of a statement by the fool. The fool has said that there is no God. So we need to be careful when we're interpreting the Bible and we're looking at the inerrancy of the Bible to remember that the Bible is true in all that it asserts. It's not necessarily true in all that it reports when it is reporting false ideas. Now, the Bible is also a unique revelation from God. Because the canon is complete, the collection of books that are in our Bible, and because the Bible contains all the revelation that man needs, we neither expect nor should we accept any additional revelation that might be offered to us by someone who claims that that revelation is necessary or if the revelation itself should claim to be necessary. The Bible is unique. It has everything that we need and we don't expect any more to be added to it. Now going further, the Bible is also a unified revelation from God. Here we come back to the matter of the human authorship of the Bible and the fact that God used many different authors. Although he did so because God is the ultimate author of the Bible, all that the Bible communicates is internally consistent and never contradictory because although the Bible has many human authors, it has one divine author who supervised the whole process. And that's quite a fascinating thing when you stop to think of the long period of time during which the Bible was being composed, and we'll be looking at that period of time a little bit later. The Bible is also an effective revelation from God. It accomplishes 
God's purposes. Let me read to you from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 to 11. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, so that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God's word accomplishes God's purposes. The Bible is also a sufficient revelation from God. By its own claim, the Bible contains all the information that we humans need for life and godliness. Peter makes this point in, first, in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. In other words, there's nothing more that we need in terms of revelation from God. Everything that we need is right here in our Bibles. The Bible is also a timeless revelation from God. And although each book of the Bible was written in a particular time and culture and place and even language, the Bible's message for us is timeless. Now let me read a passage to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul has just gone through a rehearsal of some of the things that the Israelites went through in Old Testament times, their experience of God's judgment when they fell into idolatry, um, things like that, their murmuring. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Now I think this is a very important statement. It is true that we don't live in times like Bible times, and yet God was very careful to arrange Scripture so that the message that it brings to us, the revelation that it gives to us, is timeless. It fits all times. It's suitable for all people in all cultures. Well, let's move on to our second question. What is in the Bible? Here we're talking about the issue of content. The Bible contains no photos, no audio recordings, and no videos. All of its contents are verbal. They're sentences that are made up of words to convey meaning. Now, I'd like to read to you um, the lyrics of a song from a Broadway play, a rather blasphemous Broadway play, known as Jesus Christ Superstar that came out when I was a young man. The song whose lyrics I'm going to read to you uh, was sung by Judas, and Judas was criticizing Jesus' choice to come at the time when he came. And as I read this, uh, these lyrics to you, keep in mind that this play was written in the modern era when things like television and radio were available and mass communication was available. This is what Judas says in his song. Every time I look at you, I don't understand why you let the things you did get so out of hand. You'd have managed better if you'd had it planned. Why'd you choose such a backward time in such a strange land? If you'd come today, you could have reached a whole nation. Israel in 4 BC had no mass communication. Now the point that Judas is making in this song is that if Jesus had waited until the modern era, when television and radio and mass communication, internet, things like that were available, he could have reached the world much more effectively. After all, not only uh, verbal communication was possible, but also video communication, the use of images, moving images. Well, I would argue that this song, aside from being blasphemous and completely wrong, really misses the point. God's choice to uh, give his revelation to us in a verbal form was very intentional because human language has a very special capability. It has the ability to communicate precisely and also in a very limited way. And we need to remember that language 
is fundamentally formed in sentences that are made up of words, organized in paragraphs and books, and these are designed to convey meaning. Language has this wonderful ability to get a thought from one person's head into another person's head, and it also has this amazing ability to be recorded and to last for thousands of years. Now, back to the question of content. The Bible contains 66 books. These 66 books were penned by approximately 40 human authors over a span of about 1,500 years. If we assume that Moses began writing the Pentateuch around the time of the Exodus, which was 1446 BC, and we know that John the Apostle wrote the book of Revelation around 96 AD, that means that the span of time is about 1,500 years. The Bible was written in three different languages, primarily two, Hebrew and Greek, but there's also some Aramaic in the Old Testament. The Bible was written in different cultures. It was composed in different locations and in different times. Now, the books of the Bible contain a wide range of different kinds or styles of literature. The technical uh, name for these styles of literature is genre. The Bible contains many different genres, and we'll be talking about genres as we go through the course. These genres utilize a range of different conventions of communication. Now, let's talk about conventions of communication for a moment. All of us use conventions of communication. One of the conventions of communication that we're all quite familiar with is uh, when we look at things on the internet or on computers, we know about hyperlinks. You click on a link and it takes you somewhere else. You have to understand that convention in order to use it. Another convention that you may be familiar with uh, is what you see when you read comics. Some of you like comic books very much. And you know that if you see a picture in a comic book and there's a little uh, circle up here with an arrow going down to a person's mouth, that means that what's written in that little circle is what the person says out loud. But if there's no arrow and instead there's a group of little bubbles coming down to the person's head, you know that that convention is telling you this is what the person is thinking, but he's not speaking it out loud. Now, how do you know this? You know this because you have experience with comic books and you've learned these conventions of communication. Conventions of communication are extremely important when we're interpreting the Bible. Now let's look at some examples of the different genres of the Bible. First, there is historical narrative. The Bible contains a lot of historical narrative. The book of Genesis, for example, or First and Second Kings, or Chronicles. The Gospels are a kind of historical narrative that focuses especially on the words and the works of Jesus Christ. The book of Acts is historical narrative. Now let me just back up for a moment before we talk about logical discourse. One of the things that's tricky about historical narrative is that we should never assume that when something is done by a person within historical narrative, that means that we should also do it. We'll see later that making such an assumption can get us into big trouble. Now the second genre that I want to look at is logical discourse. We see logical discourse in the book of Romans where Paul takes us through a very complex and logical theological discussion, first of all, of the sinfulness of man and his need for salvation, God's provision of salvation, and then the way in which believers should live once they have received salvation. The book of Hebrews is also logical discourse, and most of the New Testament epistles contain quite a bit of logical discourse. Then we're going to be looking at two kinds of prophecy. Now, I'll put them both on the screen for starters. We could call them forth-telling prophecy and foretelling prophecy, or we could also call them ethical prophecy and predictive prophecy. Now, forth-telling or ethical prophecy is essentially preaching that is aimed at the recipients in order to help them to know how God is viewing their behavior and in order to deliver them a message which is very often a call to repentance, a call to turn back to God. There's lots of 
foretelling or ethical prophecy in the Old Testament. For example, uh, the book of Isaiah contains quite a bit of it. Let me read just a little bit to you from Isaiah chapter 1 as Isaiah begins to open his message to the people of Judah. Chapter 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know, my people do not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel, they have turned away backward. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence, and it is desolate as over, overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Now, this is clearly a message from God rebuking the people of Judah for their sinful behavior. And it's interesting, you probably don't even need to think about it. But if you were to look closely at this passage, you would see that God is comparing the people of Judah to a barnyard animal that is so foolish that it isn't willing to follow its master. And the master is beating the animal again and again, trying to get it to do what it's supposed to do. And the animal just sits there stubbornly, accumulating bruises and wounds. Now, in the passage that we just read, God explains that what he's really talking about is the experience of the people of Judah where God has brought calamities into their experience and they have not gotten the message of those calamities, which is that they need to repent. There's lots of foretelling or ethical prophecy in the Old Testament. The book of Amos is a particularly strong one in which God talks about the economic oppression of the poor by the wealthy in the uh, nation of Israel. Now, the second kind of prophecy we would call forthtelling or predictive prophecy. There's lots of this in the Old Testament as well. Now, within the book of Isaiah, we have a very well-known passage of predictive prophecy, which you have probably heard frequently around Christmas time. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born and a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, when Isaiah wrote this passage, the event of the incarnation of Christ was more than 700 years in the future, and this passage certainly looks forward to that event. We'll come back to this passage again, and we'll actually see that in this passage we see a reference to the first coming and also to the second coming ministry of Christ, which has not yet taken place. Now, the book of Daniel has a large amount of predictive prophecy. Daniel chapter 2 contains the dream of Nebuchadnezzar in which he sees a statue composed of four different kinds of metals. That dream is essentially a prediction of the sequence of four Gentile empires that's going to come before the second coming of Christ. Daniel chapter 7 has detailed prophecy regarding the future tribulation period and the ministry of the Antichrist. And Daniel 9 through 12 takes us forward into the future all the way to the time of the second coming of Christ. And obviously, you know that the book of Revelation, most of it, verses 4 through 22, look forward to events that are still future in our day. Well, the next genre that we want to look at is 
wisdom literature. Now, wisdom literature is different from logical discourse. Logical discourse typically states um, theological truths that are universal, that are absolute, that do not have exception. But wisdom literature is different. Wisdom literature focuses on skill for living. Wisdom literature often states truths that are generally true, but not always true. Uh, we have Proverbs. We have the book of Ecclesiastes. And many people would classify the New Testament book of James as being in many ways like the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. Next we come to poetry. Now poetry again is different. As we'll see in the Bible, the poetry of scripture is not like modern poetry in having rhyme in the sense of sounds or in the sense of rhythm. The poetry of the Bible does have a certain kind of rhyming, but it's conceptual rhyme rather than rhyme of sound or rhythm. And interestingly, this kind of a rhyme or this kind of a structure survives translation. It's a very fascinating thing. Now, obviously, uh, poetry often includes very emotional language, um, strong figures of speech, exaggerations, hyperbole. Um, and when you read poetry, you're not typically looking for strong theological statements. You're looking for feelings. You're looking for ideas that the psalmist is expressing that have to do with his personal experience. So we've got poetry in the book of Psalms. We've got poetry in the book of Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and many other places in the Bible. Well, then we come to an interesting genre, parable. Most of the parables in the Bible uh, were spoken by Jesus. A parable is basically an illustration of a principle that's under discussion. Parables usually take place in everyday types of settings. They're always fictional, but they describe the kinds of things that we know from our experience, and they make a point, they illustrate a point that's under discussion. Then we come to allegories. Now, the whole topic of allegory is rather tricky when we're talking about Bible interpretation, and here's why. There are allegories in the Bible, and there is also a method of interpretation called allegorical interpretation. Now, when we have an allegory, we should interpret it as an allegory, but it's wrong to take a text that is not an allegory and to treat it as if it is an allegory. We'll go over this a little bit later, but let's take a look at uh, one of the allegories in the Bible. It's in 2 Kings chapter 14. 2 Kings chapter 14. Now this is a very brief allegory. It's only one sentence. Now let me give you a little bit of background. Um, Joash is the king in the northern kingdom of Israel at this time, and Amaziah is the king in Judah. And Amaziah is thinking about going to war with the northern kingdom in the hope of reuniting the two kingdoms into one nation of Israel. Well, Joash or Jehoash of the northern kingdom hears about this and he sends a message. Listen to verse 9. And Jehoash king of Israel sent to Amaziah the king of Judah, saying, the thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, Give your daughter to my son as wife. And a wild beast that was in Lebanon passed by and trampled the thistle. Now, obviously, thistles don't marry cedar trees. This is an allegory. This is a fictional story um, which is not true to life, and yet it contains a message we will see how to interpret allegories later. Now let me refer to another allegory that you may be familiar with. It's a very long one. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 23. And I'll read just the beginning of it and it'll probably bring it to your mind. Ezekiel chapter three, uh, 23, excuse me, starting with verse one. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother. They committed harlotry in Egypt. They committed harlotry in their youth. Their breasts were there embraced, 
Their virgin bosom was there pressed. Their names, Ohola, the elder, and Oholaba, her sister. They were mine. And they bore sons and daughters. As for their names, Samaria is Ohola, and Jerusalem is Oholaba. Now, if we were to read farther into the chapter, we would see God describing these two women as being wicked, adulterous women who are married, and yet they run after other men. They commit sexual immorality with those other men, and they are unfaithful to their husband. And there are many aspects of uh, the story that we see in this allegory that have connections with actual events that happened in the history of Israel. We'll see that allegory um, has its own conventions of communication, and we'll also see that it's a big error to try to apply those conventions to portions of scripture which are not, in fact, allegories. Now, the last genre that I want to bring to your attention right now is legal material. The Old Testament has quite a bit of legal material. The book of Leviticus is almost all legal material. Deuteronomy chapter 5 through 26 is primarily legal material. Legal material is laws given to the nation of Israel, generally speaking, and they prescribe the ways in which God wants uh, the people to whom these laws apply to live. Now, one of the challenges of Bible interpretation is not so much understanding what the laws say, because that's usually pretty clear, but addressing the question, to whom do these laws apply? And we'll be talking about that some as we go through our workshop on interpretation. Well, let's move on to our next question. Why do we need to interpret the Bible? Why is it important that we learn how to do hermeneutics? Why can't we just pick up a Bible, read it, and move into application? Well, the first thing that I would say is this. All forms of communication require interpretation. Let me say this further. Accurate communication requires active participation by both the transmitter and the receiver. Now, if you're married, you probably know by experience how important active participation as a listener is. In my experience, most of the arguments that arise between my wife and myself are caused when one of us is speaking and the other one is listening, but not really listening actively and what the listener thinks the speaker has said isn't really what the speaker meant. Now, there's an interesting illustration of the necessity of uh, active listening in the experience of uh, armies in World War II. In World War II, one of the most important things that was going on was the conveying of orders from commanders to their soldiers, navies, air force in the fields. And it was very important to keep those orders secret from the enemy. So various forms of code were developed. Now, one of the most effective forms of code that was used in the Pacific uh, by the US armies was the Navajo language. We have Navajo Indians in the United States and they have a very unique language that's quite unusual and different from most other languages in the world. And the U.S. Armed Forces figured out that if they used a Navajo speaker to simply give voice commands over the radio, and there was a Navajo listening on the other hand, on the other end to receive those commands, he could translate those back into English. And this method of uh, communication was very effective. Now, it was very important to have a good voice link between the transmitter and the receiver. And the person who was receiving on the other end, who spoke the Navajo language, had to listen very carefully to make sure that he got the message right. And we found out after the war was over that the Japanese were completely confused because they couldn't figure out what was going on with this form of communication. Now, another reason why we need to interpret the Bible is that we need the information, excuse me, and the message that the Bible contains. What the Bible contains is very important to us, and it's vital that we get that information and that message. 
In order to receive that information and message accurately, we must interpret correctly. It is very possible, in fact, it's very easy to interpret incorrectly, and if we do so, we're going to be heading off in the wrong direction. Now, here's a point that we need to make regarding interpreting the Bible. Although the message of the Bible never changes, each generation must interpret the Bible for itself. Now, you may ask why. Why can't we just use the interpretation of prior generations instead of ourselves going through the work of interpreting the Bible for ourselves? Well, here's what I would say. Each generation needs to know God personally through his word. There's something special about reading the Bible. It's different than just being handed someone else's interpretation or distillation of the message and the information of the Bible. Now, I teach systematic theology, and in systematic theology, what we seek to do is to collect the information and the teaching of the Bible and to present it in an organized way. So we'll talk about soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. We'll talk about pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about um, ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. And as we go through systematic theology, we're trying to be exhaustive in dealing with all the different topics of the Bible. But I would never tell my students that they don't need to read their Bibles. All that they need to do is learn systematic theology because there's something special about reading the Word of God. When we read the Word of God, we see God's personality. We see the way that He feels about us and the way that He wants us to feel about Him. Um, we should never think that reading a theology book or reading a book by a human about the Bible can ever take the place of reading and interpreting the Bible ourselves. There's something special about that process of discovery of the meaning of God's word as we interpret it ourselves. Now, I want to move on to the question of how others have interpreted the Bible. And here we're talking about the history of Bible interpretation. In the history of interpreting the Bible, basically five different methods have been used by Jews in the period when the Old Testament was being composed by Christians and also by other people at various times in history. And we're going to see that although our focus will be on interpretation of the Bible, uh, the interpretation of other things, other kinds of literature, has also affected the way in which believers have interpreted the Bible. So here's a list of the five different methods. Literal interpretation, allegorical interpretation, traditional interpretation, rationalistic interpretation, and subjective interpretation. Now, I want to consider each one of these briefly, and we'll start by considering the history of these methods. So if you look at the diagram on the screen, what I'm showing you here is a timeline running from around 1500 BC all the way up until our present time, a little bit after AD 2000. And I've put some uh, markers, some milestones on the timeline. We've got the time of Moses around the 1440s down to 1406 when he died. We've got the time of Ezra. We've got the time of Plato. Plato was a very influential uh, Greek philosopher and interpreter. We've got the time of Christ. And then I'm showing you four periods of time. The Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and the modern and postmodern eras, which overlap to a large extent. Now, the Middle Ages ran from about four, or AD 450 up until maybe 1450. The Renaissance followed, and that ran approximately up until the year 1700. From 1700 to perhaps oh, the middle 1800s, we have the period known as the Enlightenment. And then from the middle 1800s up until the present, we have what's called the modern era. And at the tail end of the modern era, maybe around 1950 up until our present time, we have the post-modern era. Now, I want to show you basically where the various types of interpretation have been used along this timeline. Well, literal interpretation was used 
from the very beginning when the first books of the Bible were written. Now, the reason we know that literal interpretation was used is that when we read, uh, for example, uh, books by prophets in uh, later parts of Old Testament history, we see them interpreting the earlier writings, particularly the legal writings regarding God's commands to the people of Israel in a very literal way. Literal interpretation um, is basically the way that people interpret most things. You take things at face value. And literal interpretation has been used by readers of the Bible ever since the Bible began to be written. Well, the second kind of interpretation is allegorical interpretation. Now, let me say once again that allegorical interpretation is not the same as interpreting allegories. Allegorical interpretation is where you take anything in the Bible and you treat it as if it's an allegory, even when it's not. And really, there are very few allegories in the Bible. So most of the time when you do this, you're approaching the Bible in an incorrect way. Now, the question is, where did allegorical interpretation come from? And the answer is that it doesn't come originally from people who are reading the Bible. It comes from the Greeks and from their efforts to deal with the embarrassing fact that Greek mythology um, pictures the Greek gods doing some very offensive kinds of things. And there was an effort to sort of whitewash that offensive behavior and say that it has some other meaning. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, then there's traditional interpretation. We're going to see that traditional interpretation isn't really a form of interpretation. It's the insistence that some authoritative body or some authoritative person has the right to tell other people what interpretation they must believe. And traditional interpretation is very important when we're discussing the Roman Catholic Church. Now, rationalistic interpretation really began during the period of the Enlightenment. This is an approach to interpreting the Bible where the interpreter says, anything that's in the Bible that doesn't match up with my concept of what is possible or what is real, I'm going to treat that as fictional. And finally, we've got subjective interpretation. And subjective interpretation really isn't interpretation in the sense that the reader is seeking to understand the meaning that's in the text. What's really going on is that the reader is responding to the text, seeking a meaning that is suitable for himself. And it's really not about trying to find out what the Bible means. It's more about trying to find out what the Bible makes me feel or think without really um, searching for the accurate meaning in the text. Now let's look at each one of these uh, methods in a little bit more detail. Let's start with literal interpretation. Literal interpretation takes the biblical text at face value. It seeks its meaning in the normal sense, in the kind of way that we would deal with almost any kind of literature or communication. Literal interpretation pays attention to the context, and here we'd be talking about historical context. Um, we'd be talking about literary context, the place of the text within the book where it's found, even the place of the text within the Bible as a whole. It pays attention to conventions of communication that are common to the particular style or, of writing or the genre that's in use. And that could include symbols and figures of speech. In literal interpretation, there's no attempt made to discover a secret meaning that is below or behind the text. Literal interpretation perhaps might be better called literary interpretation because it's paying attention to and it's respecting the literary style that was chosen by the author in his effort to communicate to the reader. Now, literal interpretation, as we've seen, was the norm in Old Testament Israel. And it's also the norm in uh, New Testament writers' use of the Old Testament. Now, we can see this clearly in the interpretation of legal material by the prophets in the Old Testament and in the ways in which the Old Testament prophets applied God's warnings to the people of Israel and to others. It's interesting, if we were to go to Nehemiah chapter 8, we could read the account of Ezra reading the law to the people who had returned to the land to rebuild the temple. And interestingly, there was a problem for them. The scriptures were written in Hebrew, but at the time 
that Ezra was teaching the people, most of these people were speaking Aramaic. And so Ezra would read the text in Hebrew and the scribes would translate it to Aramaic and they would also explain the meaning of the text. So when we read that they are making the text clear to the people, they're not only translating from one language to another, but they're also explaining the meaning using literal interpretation. Well, the next kind of interpretation is allegorical interpretation. Allegorical interpretation is a method where you seek a hidden meaning that is behind or below the normal literal meaning. Now, when you're doing allegorical interpretation, you treat all texts as allegories, even when they are not allegories. And the text is viewed as a kind of code which needs to be deciphered in order to discover this hidden, uh, often considered to be spiritual meaning, which is viewed as being more significant and more profound than the literal meaning. Now, allegorical interpretation was developed and popularized by Greek scholars in their efforts to explain away the embarrassing behavior of the gods of Greek mythology. Now, if you read Greek mythology, you will see that the Greek gods are very often driven by lust. There are many cases of incest between the gods and even murder. And through allegorization, the Greek scholars sought to say, well, this isn't really what this story is about. There's a more spiritual, more acceptable meaning behind the text, and they would make up these meanings and sort of inject them into the text. Now, Jews living in, in Alexandria, Alexandria was the center of Greek culture during the intertestamental period, they were exposed to allegorical interpretation. Many of these Jews admired Plato. Many of them adopted his ideas and his methods, including allegorical interpretation. Many of the Alexandrian Jews, including Philo, who uh, was born a little bit before Christ and who lived a little bit after uh, Christ's return to heaven, applied allegorical interpretation to the Jewish scriptures. Now, let me give you some examples of allegorical interpretation. Clement of Alexandria was one of the church fathers. He lived from A.D. 155 to 216. He said that Mosaic prohibitions against eating pork, eating hawks, eating eagles, and eating ravens really refer to unclean lusts for food, for injustice, for robbery, and for greed. He said that in the story of the feeding of the 5,000 by Jesus, the two fish represent Greek philosophy. And then we have Origen. Origen lived in a similar time period, a little bit later than Clement of Alexandria. He was also born in Egypt. He was educated in Alexandria. He's often called the father of allegorization. Listen to some of his views, which were uh, allegorical interpretation without doubt. He said that Noah's Ark represents the church and Noah represents Christ. He said that in the triumphal entry, the donkey represents the Old Testament and the donkey's colt upon which Jesus rode represents the New Testament. He looked at the list in Numbers chapter 33 of the many places where the Israelites camped during the wilderness wanderings. There are 30, 30 or 40 of them. And he tried to interpret the names of those places as representing stages in the progress of the soul. I think he was talking about stages in the process of uh, sanctification. Now, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, this is what he said the various things represented. The man who is robbed is Adam. Jericho is the world. Jerusalem represents paradise. The robbers are hostile powers. The priest is the law. The Levite is the prophets. And the Samaritan is Christ himself. Now, you can see that this is very fanciful stuff, and it really has nothing to do with what's in the biblical text. So allegorical interpretation is quite troublesome and quite dangerous, and we're going to be very careful to avoid allegorical interpretation. Now, just so you know, Alexandria is in Egypt. It's near the uh, Nile Delta. It was the center of Greek culture and allegorical interpretation in the intertestamental period and beyond that, leading up into the time of Christ and the time of the early church. Now, Antioch was Paul's home church 
and this became the center of literal interpretation. So in the early church, we've got a little bit of a battle going on between allegorical interpretation and literal interpretation. And of course, literal interpretation is the proper way. Well, next let's talk about traditional interpretation. Traditional interpretation is not really a form of interpretation at all. It's rather the insistence that interpretations held by some authoritative person or some official organization must be accepted as true by members of that organization. Now, when traditional interpretation is asserted, the individuals are discouraged from personal study and interpretation of the Bible. Now, traditional interpretation is often used in religious cults as a means of controlling their members. Now, the Roman Catholic Church holds to three sources of authority, and you will see that tradition has a very strong uh, power within the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church holds scripture as being authoritative, but it's important for us to keep in mind that the Roman Catholic Bible, since the time of the Reformation, has included seven additional deuterocanonical books, which were added um, after the Protestant Reformation began um, to their Old Testament. We reject those books. They are not canonical. Now, they also hold to tradition. Now, the Roman Catholics use the term tradition in a very special way. When they speak of tradition, they're speaking of alleged oral teachings of Jesus, which are not recorded in the Bible, which were passed from Jesus to the apostles and then passed to the bishops within the Roman Catholic Church. Now, to our knowledge, there is no such tradition. And then they speak of the magisterium. The magisterium is what they call the teachings of the Pope and the bishops where they make their authoritative statements regarding what is and what is not true and what the Bible means or may not mean. Now, we who are Protestants reject this entire idea of authoritative tradition. We don't recognize any one person or when any one body as having the right to tell us what we must understand the Bible to mean. Now, that doesn't mean that we see no value in tradition. We can learn many things from the views of other people in previous generations and the views of other people in our own generation. But we still recognize the responsibility and the privilege of each believer to read and interpret the Bible for himself. Now, here's a good time to make the point that you as an individual have a responsibility to interpret the scriptures for yourself. Let me share a number of passages uh, from the Bible which emphasize this responsibility. 2 Timothy 2.15. Here Paul is talking to the young pastor Timothy. And he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now here Paul is using a figure of speech. Rightly dividing refers to the work of a carpenter where he uses a saw and he cuts a straight line in order that the joints of what he's building will go together properly. He's saying that as an interpreter, you are a workman in the word and you have a responsibility to do your work of interpretation well. Now, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Here, uh, Luke is commenting on the people of Berea. Paul went to speak to them after he spent time with the Thessalonians, uh, the Th Thessalonians excuse me. And this is what he says. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. In other words, Luke is saying that the Bereans listened to what Paul taught them, but they didn't accept what ta Paul taught them as being true without reading their own Bibles, interpreting their own Bibles, and verifying the accuracy of the interpretations that Paul had given to them. Then we come to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, this is not a spooky statement about ghosts or invisible spirits. When John talks about a spirit, he's talking about a message brought by a human being who claims to be 
a spokesman for God. And he says, we have a duty to test the messages that are brought to us. And how do we do it? We test them against the writings and the meaning found in Scripture. Now, lastly, there's verse 3 from the book of Jude. Jude says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And once again, Jude is saying that we as believers have a responsibility to know what the Bible says and to defend the truth of what the Bible says against the propagation of error. The only way to do that is for us to interpret the Bible and to interpret it accurately. Well, now we come to rationalistic interpretation. This is an approach to, the, to interpreting the Bible that insists that any idea or any teaching of the Bible that's not compatible with man's reason must be rejected as false. Rationalistic interpretation makes the human interpreter the final judge of biblical truth, and this effectively undermines the authority of Scripture. Now, rationalistic interpretation is really not interpretation at all. It's really a method that's used to either accept or reject particular teachings of the Bible, depending upon whether they are acceptable in the eyes of the interpreter. Rationalistic interpretation, in many cases, is closely associated with the worldview known as scientific materialism. Scientific materialism is a worldview that it insists that all realities are purely physical in nature. In other words, everything in the universe is either matter or energy. Everything in the universe obeys what we understand to be physical laws. The worldview of scientific materialism rejects the existence of supernatural or spiritual realities. It basically says such things don't exist and therefore if the Bible talks about it, we can't believe it. Now let me show you some, some examples of rationalistic interpretation from a German theologian named Rudolf Bultmann. Now you'll see as we read uh, his comments that he certainly was not a true believer. You can see this from his attitude toward the scriptures. This is what he says. All this belief in a three-tiered universe with spirit beings such as angels and demons, etc., is the language of mythology. To the extent the kerugma, and here kerugma means the preaching of the Bible, what the Bible teaches. To the extent the kerugma is incredible to modern man, to this extent the kerugma is incredible to modern man, for he is convinced that the mythical view of the world is obsolete. Man's knowledge and mastery of the world have advanced to such an extent through science and technology that it's no longer possible for anyone seriously to hold the New Testament view of the world. In fact, there is no one who does. What meaning, for example, can we attach to such phrases in the creed as descended into hell or ascended into heaven? We no longer believe in the three-storied universe which the creeds take for granted. Pretty outrageous statement. Or how about this one? Again, the biblical doctrine that death is the punishment of sin is equally abhorrent to naturalism and idealism, since they both regard death as a simple and necessary process of nature. The same objection applies to the doctrine of the atonement. How can the guilt of one man be expiated by the death of another who is sinless, if one may speak of a sinless man at all? What primitive notions of guilt and righteousness does this apply, and what primitive idea of God? Notice that Boltman is completely rejecting the doctrine of the penal substitutionary atonement that our salvation is based upon. Another expression from Boltman. He says, It is impossible to use electric light and the wireless, in other words, radio, television, and to avail ourselves of modern medical and surgical discoveries, and at the same time to believe in the New Testament world of spirits and miracles. We may think we can manage it in our own lives, but to expect others to do so is to make the Christian faith unintelligible and unacceptable to the modern world. Now my question as I read these statements from Bultmann is, what does he think biblical Christianity is. He's thrown out all the essence of biblical Christianity. He's denied the truth of the gospel. Uh, by the way, Boltmann 
said that we need to demythologize the Bible. And the primary place where he spoke about that was in the Gospels. He said, the Gospels talk about miracles, but miracles can't happen. So wherever the Gospels talk about miracles, we need to reject those things as if they had never happened. You can see that rationalistic interpretation essentially undermines all of the truth of the Bible. And if you approach the Bible this way, you may as well throw it out. You're never going to find the truth. Well, let's move on now to subjective interpretation. Subjective interpretation is an approach to Bible interpretation in which the meaning of a given text is not considered to be fixed and objective. Instead, meaning arises in the mind of each particular reader as he reads. What matters most is not really what the text says, but the response that the text arouses in the individual reader. Now, unfortunately, we Christians sometimes slip into subjective interpretation when we get together for a Bible study. We sit in a circle, we read a text, and before we do the hard work of seeking to understand the meaning of the text in an objective way, we turn to each person in the group and we say, what does this text mean to you? What does this text mean to you? When we do that, we're making a big mistake. What we're really doing is we are jumping over interpretation and jumping into application. In order to avoid falling into this trap, it's crucial to distinguish between interpretation, which is discovering the meaning which is found in the text, and application, which is discovering the significance of the text for a given situation and for a given person. Now, going back to our uh, visual on interpret interpretive methods in history, let me um, recap these interpretive methods with some key evaluations of them. In literal interpretation, we're seeking uh, to find out what the Bible says. In other words, literal interpretation says that the Bible means what it says. Now, allegorical interpretation was originally developed in order to cleanse the Greek myths. Greek myths must be cleansed of their obvious literal meaning. Traditional interpretation is something that's very strong in the Roman Catholic Church. The idea here is that the Roman Catholic Church must be obeyed. Rationalistic interpretation says that human reason is the ultimate judge of truth. And subjective interpretation says that truth is individual, it's not absolute. Now, I hope you can see that we really need to go with literal interpretation because all of the other methods in some way rob from the biblical text its authority. They place man in a higher position than scripture itself, and of course that is wrong. Let's finish with some concluding observations. Allegorical interpretation, that is interpreting texts allegorically when they're not allegories, is wrong. However, if a text is truly an allegory, then it should be interpreted as an allegory, allowing the text to specify the conventions of meaning, conventions of communication, and thus the meaning. Now, traditional interpretation is wrong because no body of humans has the right to insist that others agree with its interpretations, nor are any humans infallible. However, tradition and when I say tradition, I mean the efforts of previous generations to understand scripture, can be very helpful to us in interpretation. Rationalistic interpretation is wrong. However, sound interpretation is rational in the sense that it's based upon the proper application of logic and reason to the evidence of scripture when we accept the scripture as being true. Subjective interpretation is also wrong. However, once we understand the meaning of a text correctly, there may be more than one way to apply it for each individual in his own special circumstances. In other words, there may be uh, many different significances to a given text, even though the text has only one meaning. Now let's have a little bit of review from this first session. Let's look at our four key questions. What is the Bible. It's a revelation from God that is inspired, inerrant, unique, 
unified, effective, sufficient, and timeless. What is in the Bible? A verbally communicated message in the form of books using various genres and communications, uh, conventions of communication. Why interpret the Bible? Because each of us needs to receive accurately the information and the message that it conveys. How have others interpreted the Bible? They've used literal interpretation, allegorical interpretation, traditional interpretation, rational interpretation, and subjective interpretation. Our focus, of course, is going to be on literal or literary interpretation because that's the proper method. Now, for those of you who are ambitious, I have a bit of homework. Number one, read Psalm 6, verses 6 to 7. Is David exaggerating in these verses? What is he actually communicating in what he says? Be specific. Number two, suppose you received a note from a friend saying, meet me at my house at 730. Must you know why he wrote the note in order to understand what he wrote? As you seek to answer that question, try to imagine some different purposes for which he or she might have sent you such a note. Number three, do you think that a text can have more than one meaning? Do you think that a text can have more than one application? Compare these two ideas. Number four, find an online Bible study website with a concordance function. Spend some time learning how to use the concordance. And then try looking up the words sin and sins in the book of Romans. See how many you can find. Well, now we're going to move on into our question and answer time. And I look forward to seeing you in our next session.